All right, everybody, welcome back to IT Pro TV's live week full of excitement. And as promised, we have an interview today with Mr. Leo Laporte. We're really excited about it. I'm actually accompanied here in the, well, in my office with Mr. Tim Broom. Tim, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to join you. To make the giant trip from <laughs> yeah. uh, three doors down the hall here. Rarely do I get that invitation, but it's good to be here. <laughs> but more important, Mr. Leo Laporte. Leo is joining us all the way from Petaluma, California. Uh, and I, I'm pretty certain that every one of our viewers knows who Leo is, but uh, Leo, why, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody just to make sure? It sounds like you don't know who I am. <laughs> this is my cop just, out. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah. Who, who are you again? And you would be, that's what I do if I don't know who the person is. Just introduce you. Tell our family a little bit about yourself. So uh, I love my relationship, our relationship with IT Pro TV, because it goes back practically to the beginning. I was a podcaster. Uh, started the Twit network of podcasts about 2005, and uh, I met uh, you guys at NAB. I think we've told this story probably ad nauseum, but I met you guys at NAB. We were doing a panel on live streaming, and uh, I think that's where you got the idea for IT Pro TV. And very, uh, very kindly from the very beginning, you've allowed us to do advertisements for you on our podcast network. And I think that's probably one of the reasons at least some of your audience knows who I am, because I might have sent them your way, maybe. Well, if, if the truth be told, IT Pro TV would not have lasted the five years that we have without Leo Laporte. So we're very grateful for you and, and your fans and your audience and everything you've done to help us. So uh, it was with great pleasure that we had this opportunity to talk to you and really kind of have your origin story and how you got started in technology. Yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, you guys have completely surpassed everything we ever did. In five years, you've done, you know, five times more than we've done in 15. But I'm, so I'm very proud of your success, and I'm, and I'm really thrilled to see you go places. And when I look at those studios in Gainesville, I'm so jealous, so <laughs> jealous. However, <laughs> uh, I think we maybe we all gotten into it for very much the same reason. You know, when I started uh, just doing technology, really what I, the way I started was as a hobbyist at first, this was back in the late 70s, the earliest days of uh, computing. And it was really because I was dropping so many quarters in the video game arcades. I thought, I really ought to have a game machine at home. And at the time, that was the VCS, the Atari uh, video game system, uh, that was really pretty junky. Uh, and from that point, I said, well, this is when it all begins, right? You get something, you know, well, there's a better one. So I got the Atari 400, which is a computer. And then, well, the chiclet keyboard, there's a better one. And I got the Atari 800. Pretty soon, you know, when I, once I got the special floppy disk drive that allowed you to read and write uh, copyright uh, game disks, I got the tape recorder for saving basic programs to it. By the time I got to that point, I think I'm thinking I gotta support this habit. This is getting to be very, very expensive. I remember that floppy drive; it was seven or eight hundred dollars. It was really expensive, and uh, and so I thought, well, if I write about this stuff in computer magazines. Uh, maybe I'll get some stuff for free, mostly software, but maybe I'll get some stuff for free. And that was how it kind of began for me, um, covering technology. And at that time, I very vividly remember saying to myself, I want to be able to somehow be able to play with the latest, greatest stuff from, that, you know, from now on. I want access to it. And that was a lot to say in the early 80s, late 70s, because at that time, I mean, uh, this was the, the era of the Lisa which was the predecessor, Apple's predecessor to the Macintosh, that was a $10,000 computer. And that was when a dollar was a dollar. So it was, this was a pretty pricey thing. I was able to talk my boss. I worked at a radio station in San Jose at the time, and I was able to talk him into getting an early uh, North Star CPM computer. And that thing had, it was pretty fancy. It had most CPM computers at the time were just text-based. Uh, it had uh, vector graphics. And I was able to do a database for him that would let him pick the music playlist and stuff like that. So that's how I got started getting pro, into programming as well. I really fell for programming. I really enjoyed that. Never did it professionally, but it was always a hobby. And it just it just grew from there. You know, I just everything I've done since has been really so that I can keep getting the latest and greatest stuff. I, <laughs> Not I, for free, at least afford it, right? I remember I had a neighbor that had that Atari 400, and that was you know an incredible. My first computer. It was a. Uh, the keypad on it was what did you call it? Chiclet. chiclet. It wasn't even chiclet. It was a membrane. It was yes. You, you'd stub your fingers trying to type on it. Like you couldn't type. You you had to like yeah. really press really hard yeah. on it. And it was terrible. It you was worked terrible. for hours and hours, and then you would get like a MIDI tune or something. 
Well, you know, this is in the era, and, and I'm really showing my age here, but you would get listings, computer game listings, in a magazine, Compute Magazine and others, and you would type them in, in, in Atari Basic. And I'm sure people with Commodores, Apple IIs, this is a similar experience across the board. And in the early days, the way you saved them was to a cassette. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there was, it would go as it's recording onto the cassette. And if there's one typo, the thing doesn't run. You got to go through it. You go blind trying to type these listings in. Uh, but, you know, in those days, it was pretty exciting because this was, our, I was never into computing when it was, you know, in the basement at the University Computer Science Lab. I just, it was too impersonal, too distant. Uh, but once you could put it on your desk and it was yours and you, you'd have full control of it, that was pretty exciting. And so we were willing to do crazy stuff like that. And you know, this is an area where I've seen a lot of advancement. Uh, you know, back then there was a lot of risk. The the equipment was very expensive, and there was not a lot of cross compatibility. So you know, there were oh god, no, there's you, no compatibility. And yeah. you couldn't even count on having that same type of system supported even a few years later. Versus today, let's say you just blindly went into Best Buy and bought a computer. So you're going to end up with something that's either Mac or Windows, maybe a Linux machine. Either way, you know, you find broad support for all three. So it's a lot easier, I think, for hobbyists to get involved and, and start to make that transition into the into the real world. I wonder, though, I talked to a friend of mine who used to do a, a program called Next Step for a CNET. He was a computer guy for years and years. And now he teaches uh, at the Academy of Art in San Francisco, teaches uh, technology. And I and he's so he's teaching young people, college kids. And I said, well, they must really understand technology. And Richard Hart is his name. And he said... No, they don't. <laughs> they said, Leo, we had to figure it out. We had to do it. It came too easily for kids in their teens and 20s. It's just been part of their life. So, in fact, they just they, they understand it as users. They know how, you know, they know what a FOMO uh, hashtag means, but the, they understand it deeply. No. And in a way, that's why you guys are doing very important work, because the training you're giving people is vital, because so many of us now, everybody uses technology. But it is, I think, a dwindling number of people who actually understand how it works and can keep it working. We, we need those people. Yeah, I guess if you think about it, if you if you get your, your cell phone or your tablet, which is for a lot of people, that is their computer these days, they, they didn't install the operating system on there. No, and, it's and an if, appliance. Even if they did install it, like you launch iTunes and click restore, you know that that's their installing versus yeah. we always had to mess around with autoexec.bat and config.sys files and, and other crazy things, you know, to get all our drivers loaded. Uh, today, it, it is becoming more and more automatic. And I, I look back, I can't remember his name, the, the old CEO of Sun Microsystems, where he said Scott that... Scott McNeely? Oh, I know, yeah. Where he, he always said that the computer should be like the telephone. You go to the store, you buy yeah. whatever phone you want, you plug it in the wall and it just works, you don't program it. And I think we're kind of getting back to that now. We're seeing a lot of, of computer systems, digital systems are just fully automated, but we still need the people behind the scenes that are making the cloud services run, the the actual platforms that power all of this. And I think it's intimidating for a lot of people. We hear this from people where they say, well, you know, I, I like computers. I mess around with them. I play video games. I, I don't think I could do IT for a career, though, because they, they see that big jump to, I know nothing about the cloud. And we always yeah. try and tell people they're just, they're just computers. You, you learn them the same way mm -hmm. you did 20 years ago. It's just well, sometimes not even different commands. A lot of the old stuff is still there. It's actually uh, it's fun that you mentioned Sun because those guys, and this is, I mean, Sun's back in the, what is it, the 80s. I mean, this is a long 70s. This is a long time ago. But those guys had a deep understanding of where we were headed. Um, one of their founders, John Gage, is the guy who coined their slogan, which I didn't get for years, which is the network is the computer. And at the time, it sounded insane. <laughs> it sounded tautological. It sounded like you're you're saying nonsense words. But when you say the network is the computer nowadays, everybody gets it. Mm -hmm. So they knew 40 years before it happened exactly uh, where we were headed. Uh, and it has been a really interesting trip. I think one of the advantages old timers like me have is because we started when it was small and you could wrap your head around it and kept doing it, we kind of have a context and an understanding for how we got here and how it works that makes it a little easier for us to look at new systems and go, oh, yeah, I get that. Uh, I feel I feel bad for somebody uh, starting from scratch because now you're looking at an ocean of information, almost you know impossible to swallow. We, we could sip at it and eventually drank that ocean, but I would hate to be starting now. This is a 
challenging thing. There's so much out there. So yeah, as a user, you flip it on, it works. But as an engineer, a network administrator, a sysop, a devop, this is a challenging space you're working in. You know, I want to get your opinion on something because it used to be that when somebody decided to get into IT, there, were, there was something that was driving them like a passion. They, they loved Apple computers, and so they wanted to become better at that, or they were using Windows to do all sorts of things. Or that, a fixer. Uh, yeah, it, and we don't really fix hardware anymore because mm -hmm. it's so cheap. You just buy new stuff. Uh, but we've got this whole movement right now where people are worried about their their personal information, privacy concerns. Uh, a lot of the software platforms that we use are are almost kind of becoming hostile to the end user. It's harder to find people that say, like, I love Apple computers. I think they treat yeah. me great, you know, because we're not always being treated great anymore. So are we... Are we potentially entering an era where maybe people won't be as excited to get into computers and IT if we feel like they're mistreating us? I hope not, but I do think that that's totally healthy because the fanboy feelings that we had, and I certainly had, uh, from those days were really kind of misguided. You might love Apple Computer or Microsoft, but they don't love you back. And I think now we're maybe a little bit more aware of the fact that these, these people are just people and the companies are just companies and the technologies are just technologies and nobody has their pulse on the you know the magic technology nothing we've you know we've seen things like theranos and magic leap and so many companies that have been hyped to the stars turn out to be well if not complete scammers at least prosaic mm -hmm. and uh and so i think that that's healthy i think that that's actually a more accurate portrayal of it i do hope though that people still can get passionate about it I don't think I've lost my passion. I think more than ever now, you don't have to be, you don't have to be a soothsayer to understand how technology changes everything in our lives. We're seeing it right now. You know, 40 years ago to say the network is a computer, that was pretty prescient. That was like, wow. Uh, today, it's obvious. Uh, and, and the changes that it, the internet and ubiquitous computing, computing at the edge, internet of things, the changes that those are bringing to every aspect of society are very real. And I would hope people would look at that and say, yeah, I want to be a part of it. I want to, you know, for for us, maybe it was, it was us saying, I want to keep up with it. That, that I don't think anybody would say that anymore. It's impossible. But I want to be a part of it. I want to understand it because it's fascinating. And I would even hope that there are people out there, we desperately need them, who say, and I want to make sure it people get treated right that people are able to compute securely and privately. I want to be a part of the solution because I don't think technology is bad or good. I think it's morally completely neutral, but it's important that there be people out there who care about how technology is used, who want it to be ethical, who want it to serve humanity instead of vice versa. And right now, I think we're teetering on, on the precipice. Right now, if you look at companies like Facebook, it really looks like uh, human beings are the f the product, the fodder for Facebook. They're not serving human beings. We're serving them. So I would hope, and I bet you a lot of your students feel this way, that people are getting into this, well, yeah, it's a good job. I make a good living, drive a nice car, take care of my family. But I would hope even more than that, because we desperately need this. They're also saying, and I want to make sure that what we do going forward serves people. Re, you know, not as dinner serves <laughs> serves people, because because we need that desperately right now. Well, you know, let's build on that because over over the last couple of decades, you have had the chance to look at a ton of technologies that were breaking, that were you know cutting edge, the newest stuff. I mean, that this really like this week in tech, you focus on what's new. There's a lot of technologies that come out that are of debatable value that you, you look at it and you say, I, I don't know that's going to be around a year from now. and Or sometimes yeah. you do, like um, uh, the Essential Phone, right? The Essential Phone from the oh, original creator, Android. Sad. And you know, it had a lot of promise. And then here we are a year oh. later where I'm wondering exactly how they make payroll each month. And so when something new comes out, uh, have you, in your experience, like found any way to, to have a, a good idea of yeah, this technology is going to be around. This is really going to make a difference. Or uh, I don't know that Magic Leap's ever going to come out. Or yeah. I think, you know, honestly, uh, that is the job. I, at least that's a big part of the job. Um, my job is to, is to, and it's very hard. I don't think anybody can predict the future. 
But uh, I think my job and the job of the people I work with is to bring our history, you know, as, a, as somebody who's been doing this for 40 years, bring the history, the context, my understanding of this, which I think gives me a little more context uh, to help understand whether something we're seeing is actually life changing or, uh, you know, just another way to pry a dollar out of your wallet. And, and I, that's part of our job. Our, the other part, of course, is to contextualize what's happening and to help people understand it. And ultimately, uh, to do what you guys do so well at IT Pro TV is to, to give people the skills so that they can command it, so that they can use it to their advantage. I, that's, all of that is part of our mission. But the part you're talking about, you know, I have a very mixed record uh, on that. So I've learned, I remember telling my dad, he'll never let me forget this, about, uh, well, I would say it's about five or six years ago at Thanksgiving, sell that Apple stock because <laughs> <laughs> they're... They're done. They're cooked. With the, you know, once Steve Jobs passed away, it was a year or two after that. There's nothing. So that was obviously wrong. Uh, I'm, and I can't say that I'm an expert on uh, finance or business, uh, but I I think I can also say that I can look at technologies like virtual reality, uh, and say, you know, there's a lot of hype going on, but really there's a lot of issues that are going to keep this from taking off right away. Uh, I'm much, for instance, I tell people I'm much more excited about augmented reality than I am virtual reality, things like that. And actually, I've been saying that for years. I think I'm starting to be proven uh, correct. I, so, I, but I, but again, my track record is not perfect. Far I love you me. being a pioneer of bringing information to us. And the the memory that comes to my mind was when you had your MacBook and you were like streaming the Apple conference. Like, <laughs> the it was iPad like the first, announcement. <laughs> that, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll it, never uh, live that down. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that was awesome as a viewer uh, to do that. I mean, you were definitely a pioneer in, in that. Well, that was always my point of view was that I, it's I don't see I and this I hate a lot of technology reporting these days because it honestly looks like they're uh, carrying water for the tech companies. And it, it was always that way, you know. It was that way with car magazines, and stereo magazines. It definitely you seems like knew. there's much more paid, and you don't really know what is real yeah. versus paid. Who, who are they? Who are they really working for? Uh, so I've always been really adamant, dogged, that I don't work for Apple. I don't work for Intel. I don't work for Microsoft. I, I work for users. I am a user. I, I represent the user's point of view. And I, well, that was a good example where, you know, a, a good, uh, you know, Apple <laughs> tech journalist might be very reluctant to annoy Apple in any way. I think it's my job. Mm -hmm. uh, as it is any good journalist's job to speak truth to power, to say, hey, guys, you know, what is this? You know, why are you making such a big deal about iPod socks? Really? Is that going to be the next big thing? I'd never forget Steve Jobs saying when, I remember the Apple Hi-Fi, it was a Hi-Fi mm -hmm. you'd plug your iPod into. And he said at the event, he said, I'm getting rid of all my high-end stereo equipment. This is the best thing I ever heard. And I'm thinking... You are not getting rid of your hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of specially weighted turntable and 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 uh, Macintosh yep. tube amps because you like this Apple Hi-Fi. Don't lie to us. So uh, and maybe he did get rid of it. If he did, that was a big mistake because the Apple Hi-Fi went away about two years later. Well, I think that's why your fans love you so much, Leo. Is that you do bring it? Well, you got to be honest. Real. Yeah. And I'm not saying I'm always right. I'm often wrong. Uh, but you're authentic and, about it. And that's what well, but that I, authenticity and I, that's and I, tr I try yeah, I try to give people my reasoning behind this, why I'm skeptical about this. And, you know, I'm like everybody else, and I have to really temper myself when we go to those events, those those especially the Steve Jobs keynotes. But nowadays, any tech keynote, it's really easy to get swept away by the demos and the promise. And 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 not to and to you know, Microsoft's build conference was uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh <laughs> I'm watching the keynote, and I had to remind myself and everybody else, this is not a live demo. In many cases, this was something that they they taped ahead of time, and they really aren't telling you anything about how this works, whether it works, when it'll be available, if it'll ever be available. As far as I'm concerned, it's it's science fiction. So it's important to remember that even when you're getting excited. Because I do, I mean, honestly, that's the other thing. I still get really excited about technology. Technology mm -hmm. is thrilling. You know, uh, when I install Linux on my old ThinkPad and it works and, uh, you know, I, I just, it's thrilling, it's exciting. And so it's important to keep that enthusiasm. I don't want to become a cynic, but at the same time, it's also important to be realistic.
You know, let, let's uh, let's talk about something that is a sure thing. A big win of yours is uh, well. IT security. So a lot of people that are, are kicking off their IT careers now have a an end game of wanting to to be a penetration tester because it's sexy. You hear about it, you know, you see hackers in the movies and all. And many years ago, you and Steve Gibson decided to to create the Security Now podcast, and uh, it it really it was risky at the time because IT security news that's not. Not something a lot of people were looking for, but today it's like an essential thing. And, and <laughs> how many episodes have you done of Security Now? Uh, we are close to. I think we're well over six hundred. Steve has promised. Steve said my system doesn't accommodate more than three digits, uh, so he's promised to retire at nine ninety nine. I'm working <laughs> on getting him to rewrite it in hexadecimal, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah. um, so he's. We've been doing this for uh, eleven, twelve, maybe thirteen years. A long time. When we started it, it was about 15 minutes long. And I remember Steve saying at the time, and he's repeated this since, I don't think is there enough security. Is there going to be enough security news to keep doing this <laughs> <laughs> forever? Our first show was actually, no, a long time ago, 14 years ago, August 18th, 2005. So uh, I would say now that the show is now more than two hours every week, and he's still jamming to put stuff in. We're up to 718 or 713 episodes. I would say there's no question there's enough security. Yes. We didn't really, honestly, we did. We started this 2005 before, you know, ransomware, before widespread uh, hacking, uh, advanced persistent threats, before any of this. This is this evolved over time, but I think credit to Steve that he saw that uh, this was going to be an important sector. And in fact, it's it's really been one of our most successful podcasts. It's easily our fastest growing podcast because i think people want this information well you know it, it's actually it, it's almost like a social service that you're you're helping people because it security is hard it's mm -hmm. hard to understand it's complex it continues to get harder so to take it in and put it into terms that just a, a layman a regular person can understand and and start to kind of get prepared for i find that people that try and jump right into like a pen testing career mm -hmm. really struggle to, to cover that gap but by learning learning the way that you cover it, right? You know, and this is kind of what inspired us with IT Pro TV is to you know, let people dip their toe in, start to just wade in instead of diving in and, and trying to tackle these ideas. Uh, I, I think to do that 14 years ago, if you think back uh, 14 years ago, the, Pioneer. The, yeah, the dot-com bubble had burst. It had been several years. IT investments were probably low. But if there was a hack or something, it was usually like a website defacement. It wasn't right. what it is right. today. Right, now it has Absolutely. global ramifications. Absolutely, yeah. I, I think Steve, the Steve's success is that he is willing to get geeky enough and down into the weeds enough so that you get real information. He doesn't oversimplify it, but he's able to communicate it in a way, I wouldn't say that the average Joe off the street could understand it, but I, he's able to communicate it in a way that somebody who is mildly you know, interested in technology and following it can, can get at least the, you know, the high level and I think that's his real skill is he's kind of hit that perfect, that sweet spot of, uh, of technical accuracy and detail without alienating people who are not super nerds. Mm. And yeah, we got a man that uh, I can't let him stop at 9.99. <laughs> that's only four or five years off. I can't let him stop. We got to keep going. Well, you got to like, uh, I don't know, do Futurama and put his head in a jar or something because IT security is <laughs> not going away. That's, that's going to be decades and yeah, decades to come. I, it's pretty clear, even if Steve retires, that we would do a show of that kind to continue to do it. Now, I, I'm going to say point. you you were a tech enthusiast, and then you go to college and you major in Mandarin. Well, I wasn't a tech enthusiast at that time. Okay, it was after. So, so it, it was after. So, in, so and you know, this is uh, you know, I graduated from high school in '73. I was I played a lot of chess, uh, and then in seven, you know, I remember my uh, working for the campus radio station in the mid '70s. And I remember um, my station manager, a good friend of mine, was he said building a computer in his dorm room, and I thought, well, this guy's such a geek, what a nerd. <laughs> we really thought that was odd. It was probably looking back on it a Mitz Altair or something like that, one of the early kit computers. And uh, but but at the time, it was as I said, it wasn't personal computing. It was you know they had the computer science department in the basement that had an IBM you know System 360 or something, and you had to bring in punch cards, and you know it was. It was a very different experience, and I now in hindsight, I kind of wish I had gotten into it. Um, you know, that was the era of the MIT hackers, Richard Stallman and, and those people working on the basement on the teletype. 
uh, I think I would have enjoyed it, but it just didn't appeal to me until after college. So yeah, college, I was in I, ostensibly a Chinese major, but really I was a radio. But you started in radio in college. That's what yeah, kind of started have... you becoming a reporter or a broadcaster. I was a DJ. A DJ. I wasn't uh, anything so fancy. I was a DJ because <laughs> I loved music. I thought, oh, this will be fun. Uh, learned pretty quickly, and I bet you some of your IT pros know this, that when you do something you love as a business, it maybe isn't quite as much fun. Uh, it kind of soured me on music, to be frank, being a DJ for so many years, because you never got to play what you wanted. Uh, you always played what the boss told you to play. So the, what did happen, though, is I was a DJ in San Jose, in Silicon Valley. And it, I was surrounded by and knew people who were really starting to change the world. And there's so, there was a buzz in the valley in those days, in the uh, mid to late 70s, that was just so exciting. And I, I caught the fever, basically. And that's what happened. So I think, though, that the big change was it got out of the basement and got onto my desk. Having personal a personal computer made all the difference in the world. So how many years between that and tech TV? So I wrote for computer magazines in the late 70s and the early 80s. I wrote for Byte and InfoWorld. I, you know, just bit pieces. I wrote for Atari magazines. Um, and, you know, that was at the same time I was a, a DJ, started doing talk radio in the in the mid 80s. And I met a guy I was doing a talk show for KNBR in San Francisco. And I used to bring in a guy uh, named John C. Dvorak, oh, yeah. who, as you know, was a very prolific, well-known computer columnist. And we hit it off. And what John realized it wasn't immediately obvious, but I, I kind of knew something about technology, about computing. And, and pretty soon, you know, we started doing a weekend show, answering people's calls. And John was very kind and generous because he was the big name. He could have just, you know, done it all himself. And I could have been his, his little announcer boy. But he let me answer questions and, and let me be part of the show. And that was where I established that I actually had some credibility and knew something about technology. We syndicated that show eventually. Um, I got called in the early 90s as I was doing this syndicated show by a guy uh, from Virginia who was a hedge fund guy named Halsey Miner. And he said, we want to start a computer television channel. And you seem to be the only guy doing national computer programming. So we need to hire you. The company he was starting was called CNET. And one of the very first things I told Halsey was, you're never going to make any money doing a computer channel. I said, CNN lost half a billion dollars before they turned a profit. Do you have half a billion dollars, Halsey? And he said, hmm. And that they started a website, of course, and CNET became very, very successful. Unfortunately, I did not go along for that ride. <laughs> one, of, one of many bad choices I've made in my uh, in my career. Uh, but that was the beginning of. I then went. He, at one point, I went to Ziff Davis, and they wanted to do a TV thing. And eventually, I helped create a show that was uh, on MSNBC when it launched. Ziff, uh, Ziff Davis was called in by Microsoft. They had done a partnership with NBC to launch a new network, MSNBC. And uh, Microsoft was insisting that NBC have tech coverage. NBC was saying, nobody cares about computers. We're not going to devote time on our... Microsoft said, you're going to call ZDNet. So we created a show for them called The Site, uh, which we did for about a year and a half on MSNBC. We started with it when it launched. I did on the site, I did a virtual reality character because they, the NBC boss did not like how I looked on TV. So I'm not going to put you on TV. So they made me do a, a car, basically a cartoon character, real-time uh, animated character that would sit with the anchor, Soledad O'Brien. She actually was at a coffee bar looking at a dot on the wall. I was that dot added in real time using a silicon graphics onyx, a mm. half million dollar computer. And I would move around and talk like this Two two <laughs> puppeteers. One guy was spinning my hair. He still works with me. Carson Bonney's my producer. Uh, Christine was, was doing my eyebrows and I was talking and doing gossip, computer era gossip and help. And, uh, that show went off the air, uh, <laughs> probably rightly so. Uh, but that was enough to kind of give me the bug. Ziff Davis, uh, right about when that show went off the air, said, you know, we should do a, a cable channel. And that's when they uh, decided to create ZDTV. They asked me to be part of that. Uh, it later, it became Tech TV. And, and uh, that's really where uh, I made I, my name. I just Googled myself. a I'm picture. I, I just Googled a picture of this. And... Uh, I mean that that's like a Thunderbirds marionette almost. This is uh... Dev, Dev Null was his name, which was a great Linux quote, you know, kind of a reference. 
because of course dev null is the non interface the null inter the and null device and uh, he he uh, was a purple barista and uh, it was actually for the time which is 1996 cutting edge technology to do real time 3D mm. character do real time cartoon it was nobody done it you know so uh, at the time it was pretty it was a cool thing to do i had to kind of wear a weird rubber suit that malfunctioned all the time, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and they put me, they they surrounded me with with blankets so that the sound wouldn't echo in the hall while Soledad got to be in the nice air conditioned studio. I'm sweating in a rubber suit, <laughs> covered with blankets in the hall, uh, but it was a it was you know it was a great experience. I won an Emmy for it, so I can't really complain. It was the only Emmy that show won. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so that was that was the beginning of my TV career, and uh, and I'm very grateful to. Uh, well, cer certainly, you know the story about ZDTV and Tech TV. You inspired me to change careers to get into technology, and I know nice. so many others because we hear from them all the time, consistently. That your fans, whenever they get into IT and they love Leo and they remember the Tech TV days, uh, it was it's crazy how popular the, that channel and those shows were. I'm very grateful. Uh, you know, I see people every day come into the studio and they say yeah i'm a geek i'm, a, I'm an it guy because of you and i that makes me feel very happy because it was in a way that was our mission what we wanted to do with tech tv uh remember tech tv was 1998 through 2004 and, and at that time of course there were plenty of geeks out there but they were kind of isolated they weren't necessarily mainstream there wasn't you know nowadays you're a geek you're just part of the everyday culture but at the time i think they felt a little left out and we wanted to I would. I really wanted to. I had. I had watched other technology programming, and, and there were some things I hated about it. it. One of the things I really hated was they would edit out all the blue screens, all the failures, all the crashes, all the dropped things. And so one of the things I said is we're going to do our shows live, and we're not going to edit. We, you know, I w we were the first network television show to install Linux on the air, Slackware Linux, back in whatever that was, 1999. And we didn't edit it. We just, you know, you got to see the whole boring process, mm -hmm. X freaking fig and everything. <laughs> and uh, and I'm very proud of that because that was real. And I think people got it that we weren't fake geeks. We actually were geeks. We didn't hire people because they looked good or they could speak well. We hired people like Patrick Norton because he was a genuine tech enthusiast, a real live geek and knew what he was talking about, knew his stuff. And he had a, he had real feelings and a real sledgehammer that he would hit stuff with when he didn't like it, and all of that communicated, I think, to people. It's okay to be a geek. It's okay. In fact, there are many of us, and we're changing the world. Mm -hmm. And I really I felt like I had a ringside seat because, of course, between 1998 and 2004, the world really did change. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that was a pretty exciting. It still is exciting. It was a very exciting. Yeah. Time. Once again, I think it goes back to that authenticity. You you started it early. It had, you continue through those real. years, and you do it today. And it that's why to I real. think people are attracted to you so much. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, honestly, um, I've been very fortunate because I learned how to be a broadcaster first for years. You know, twenty years perfecting that skill, which is kind of a hard thing to do. But that was completely separate from being a tech enthusiast. I learned those separately. And I've been very fortunate that I could finally found a place to combine them both. And uh, and that that's given me a pretty good career. I mean, I, I really enjoyed it. I don't want to. My problem is I don't want to stop. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in the 60s now. And I know at some point people are going to say, well, how could you possibly know anything about this stuff? You're too old. And I say, no, I'm not. <laughs> I just don't want to stop. I love doing this so much. Well, I, I want to keep doing it. So the story that I, I like to tell is that when you get into IT, if you're a tech enthusiast and you enjoy technology and want to learn, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be the guy that works on the network or work on the equipment or in the cloud. There's lots of salespeople. You know, you are a broadcaster. Sure. You know, you could be yeah. a leader of an organization. You know, if you understand the technology, there's lots of things you can do. So everybody should really dive in and learn as much as they can. And then yeah. you were attracted to the broadcast side, you know, Don on the, 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 actually he wasn't attracted to the teaching side. We pulled him into the <laughs> teaching side, you know, uh, but I think that's the best way to go. When we look at people for twit, we always look for them to be geeks first. Mm -hmm. I can teach you how to, how to communicate, but I can't teach you the enthusiasm and love of technology and the deep understanding. That seems to be almost a genetic thing. It's just people who get it and people who don't get it. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, the people who get it, you know, I, those are the people I really want to put on the air because uh, those are the best teachers, right? They're yep. the people who can communicate their enthusiasm yep. and their uh, deep understanding of what's going on. My, uh, you know, my other problem is that the world is kind of leaving me behind. I'm, a, I'm kind of an old school geek. You know, I, I still like putting hardware together. I still like coding. Uh, I still, you know, I really, I really like Linux. And so I'm kind of an old school geek. And I wonder, you know, as it gets more mainstream, I'm going to be kind of like that TV repair guy in the dusty shop down in the corner of the mall who's got, you know, tubed TVs that he'll fix. <laughs> and the, uh, the, the Maytag repairman that's just yeah. uh, waiting yeah, for the call. Lonely. Yeah, lonely. Well, uh, I'll tell you one thing that I found is, is really just great about IT as a career is how how diverse and accepting it is that uh, yeah. when when you look back, well, I mean, even like when you were getting started in the 70s, it was not very accessible to people. The equipment was very expensive. A lot of people had to do it through universities that were, uh, well, also very expensive versus today where pretty much everybody has access to all the technology, all, all of these cloud platforms that are web-based. You just need a web browser oh, and you can jump on there and do it. Uh, it's amazing. And so you're finding people young, old, different races, different cultures, uh, e even people with disabilities. Like mm -hmm. IT is a phenomenal career because you really do have that level of access. And uh, you, you probably see that more clearly than we do because of your, like your, your viewer base. You, you, know, you have a, a lot of different people to reach out to you. I think that was the thing that really in the beginning attracted me the most is that there, this is one of the few areas in life that's a true meritocracy. Engineering in general. If a bridge stands up, it stands up. If it falls down, it falls down. It doesn't matter if a man or a woman designed it. It, it, it. That's the beauty of this. You are judged in the in the in the technology world, in the IT world. You are judged by your knowledge, your abilities, your skills, not by how you look, who you are, your race, religion. Your none of that matters if you can do the job. Uh, and so I I embrace that. And this is one of the few areas in broadcasting where you can speak to kids and people in their 80s and they're on an even par, you know, that they if, if you know, they're, they're, everybody has a shot. You just have to have, the, you know, a desire. Mm -hmm. And I love that. That to me is what makes this the best thing in the world. You know, I can meet if I we get people come into our studios and join us, you know, sit in the studio all the time. And a lot of times. They say things like, well, I really know you. I've known you for years, but you don't know me. And I say, no, no, dude, I know you because I, we're geeks. We know each other. We get it. I see them and I can see them across the, across the room and know <laughs> and say, one of us. And I love that. I really love that. And it's not based on gender, race, creed, none of that. It's based on you. That's beautiful. Yeah, and I think you know people get to accent what, what they're good at. So, uh, you know, right. if you want to get an IT, you, you mentioned uh, all the, the ancillary careers like project management or, or mm -hmm. whatever, but if you want to write code, if you want to be a network engineer, if you, if you don't want to talk to people, that's fine. Be, be a network engineer. <laughs> you can jump in and find that one that's right for you. Now, as you Actually, that's the hardest thing for us to find is geeks that want to talk to people because <laughs> most of us are complete introverts. Yep. Uh, I am an introvert and I have to force myself not to be. That's the hardest thing for us. I can find plenty of geeks. Finding somebody who's an extrovert, that's a lot harder. Yeah, they can string a sentence together. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, but you're, you're absolutely right. The, 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 the field has gotten so broad. There is there's room for everybody in this. And, and, you know, in a way, this is what life is. You should find that thing that, that excites you, whatever that is. And that's the thing you should pursue. Don't force yourself a square peg in a round hole because you don't have to. There's an opportunity for almost anybody because there's so many problems that need to be solved. Now, we're talking about like all the positive aspects of this. There is a little bit of negative brewing right now. You know, we are hearing about a lot of, especially like in Silicon Valley, some companies that are uh, coming under scrutiny for practices as far as like handling personal data, uh, how they're paying their taxes, the, the, the basic uh, what is it, the base cost of living in the the valley there? You know, I mean, there's just a lot of things now that are, are kind of becoming the negative side of IT. And I, I feel like this is just a, a phase that we'll move through and that'll be it. But there could be a bit of backlash. And, you know, we might see a, a little bit of contraction in the market there as, as people kind of balance out. But what I'm seeing is that it's no longer just about Silicon Valley. We're starting to see 
you know, lots of tech building up in Texas. We're seeing mm-hmm. it you know, around Washington, D.C., all the government. Uh, a lot of other countries are starting to really step up and move into that space. But that's kind of created growing pains, too. So now you've got countries like Russia just the other week did the uh, where they're now able to run their own isolated internet. And China has done that for a long time. So on a on a global scale, eventually we run into this position where you can't have companies that are part of one country providing a service globally to everybody. So what do you think we're going to start seeing as we move forward? Are, are technologies going to just start to be held within country borders, or are we going to, to you know, find some way to overcome that? So, yeah, there are, there are actually a lot of questions in there. Let me, let me start at the beginning. Some of the problems with, this, with the tech, technology we have right now are really due to its success, right? The amount of money, you know, mm-hmm. as we're speaking, as we're recording this, Uber just went public today, minting maybe a thousand new millionaires in San Francisco. That's not good. <laughs> That's going to really be hard. <laughs> uh, that means housing prices go up. I mean, everything changes. So, and that's just some, some of that's just the success of technology. Uh, but also when there's money that draws in scammers, that's why you can look at something like Theranos where they raised billions of dollars on a promise that couldn't, they couldn't deliver on. So that's also part of the success of technology. And, and really a lot of what you're talking about comes because technology is now so interwoven in life that it has all the problems life has. There's bad people, there's bad things, there's problems. Uh, that's just, that's again, a measure of how uh, universal tech has become. So the things that you see, you know, the problems that Facebook had with Cambridge Analytica or Twitter has with, with trolls, that's because real life has intruded on our nice little private tech bubble. Um, but, but, you know, that's life, that's the world out there. There is a bigger issue, which you also alluded to, which is this, what we call sometimes splinter nets that, uh, and this is, I don't, I think this is a manifestation. This is not a technical issue. This is a manifestation of what's happening in the world, which is that countries are throwing up walls instead of uh, building bridges, they're building walls, they're shutting down, they're closing off. China's doing it. Russia's doing it to some degree. I'm afraid we might start doing that. And that isn't what the internet's all about. The internet, there's a great book, uh, by my friend, John Markov called what the door, Dormouse said, that's uh, all about the fact that Silicon Valley came out of the hippie counterculture revolution of the 60s. That's who Steve Jobs was to some degree. Uh, that's who many of the founders, the Sun uh, Microsystems founders were. They had this kind of mentality uh, this of, of sharing and of, of openness and uh, that really created something that is all about openness and sharing and breaking down walls. That's the internet. The internet works best when there are no barriers. There are no firewalls. There, it's it's out there. And of course, there are problems. That's why we have IT Pro TV because people have to secure it, have to protect you. But but what we don't want to see is splinter nets, which is a Russian internet and a Chinese internet and American internet. And I'm afraid that's the direction we're moving in. I don't think that's a technical direction. I don't think it's coming out of the technology. Quite the opposite. I think that's coming out of politics. And it's unfortunately bleeding back into technology. So all of the problems that you just mentioned, all the problems we see in technology, really, that's what they are. They're life bleeding into this nice little sterile, pristine world of technology that we created. And, but that's why the fight is so important now to keep technology open, to keep that technology serving people, to keep it from being used against people. Uh, this is really an important battle. And I think that technologists today can't sit in our little uh, room being introverts and programming away. We've really got to become ethical uh, human beings and participate in this revolution because, uh, as I said, technology has is neither good nor bad, but it only goes in the direction that people push it, and we need to push it in that positive, I think, uh, direction. And that's probably one of the, the biggest changes that like my, my career obviously not as long as yours but uh even in in my Why time you say obviously not as long as yours because you guys because he's not as old as <laughs> yes, i know go ahead so so I, I i've been in it for 20 years uh which is you know not i'm not young but i'm 
certainly not like you, Tim. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, you know, for me, the shocking thing has been that w- when I got started in IT, uh, it was it was fun. It was a hobby, you know, much much like yours, where you, you know you started with a video game console, and now I look at it and I see how it's literally been weaponized that you know yeah. it, it's able yeah. to be governments can use it to control people uh it it can control do all sorts of things and and it kind of shows you that there's a lot of benefits to the technology that we have but there's mm-hmm. there's consequences that come along with it so for people that are just getting into the career now I think that's a lot more visible. I mean, that didn't even really exist in my mind. I, I guess there oh. were some movies like Tron, right? <laughs> okay, well, I get hit with a frisbee in the head, and I'm, I'm gone. So. <laughs> that's the worst that can happen to you? Well, uh, no, I think you're right. And I don't want to scare people off. It doesn't mean that there's suddenly a burden if you're getting into IT, that there's suddenly a burden to change the world. But I do hope that uh, young people, especially coming up, will realize that, that uh, ethics are so important in everything we do. But they, but we are not isolated from that either in in technology, and uh, you know, I, if if here's an to me a very concrete example. I was talking to Cory Doctorow, who's a wonderful speaker, uh, novelist, science fiction author, uh, one of the uh, uh, very important spokespeople at uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And we were talking about Facebook, and he said, "Well, my hope, long term, is that uh, technologists will handle this problem." That People will step forward and create solutions, create the, a better, more ethical, more private Facebook, for example. It's up to us. We can't look to government for a solution. We can't wait for government to make a solution. And often the solutions they come up with are not the best solution. It's up to us as technologists to have a vision for how the future should be and to make it happen. And so the skills that you're learning at IT Pro TV, the skills that you know we try to impart to a lesser degree, are critical skills for making the world a better place. It's not just about fixing the computer. It's about making the world a better place. And we need everybody involved in this process. Well, Leo, I want to tell you, thank you for uh, inspiring me in the 90s uh, to get into IT. Thank you for your authenticity. Thank you for bringing the information to everyone so we can make those decisions. We're, we're very grateful. And just knowing you uh, over the past five years, you know your humility, uh, is amazing because I, you know, I believe, you know, I kind of claimed you as the godfather of technology broadcast, <laughs> and uh, it's great to uh, to work with you and, and Lisa. You guys have always taken great care of us, and uh, our entire team is very grateful. Well, we're, it goes right back at you. We're so proud of Tim and uh, Donna of what you've done and the success. And I love it that we can send, you know, audience members from uh, from Twit who want to get these skills. I can send them to IT Pro TV and say, here is a great place you can learn. Um, it's, I'm I'm thrilled you exist. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank Leo, you. thank you for your time. And, you know, for everybody out there watching, thank you for tuning in. But stay tuned because we've got more IT Pro TV Live Week coming up next.